been asked to do an overview of the state of play as it relates to federal infrastructure policy. And as I go through this um, policy uh, overview, again, feel free to ask any questions in the chat function if you want. We can either do that uh, probably best at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation, but uh, certainly we can go from there. So no um, conversation about the state of America's infrastructure, and certainly at a policy level, is complete or could even start without um, understanding the failing state of America's infrastructure. And of course, to the folks on this phone, uh, this call today, um, that's not a surprise. At policy levels, uh, one group that particularly quantifies a lot of these concerns is the American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE, which a lot of you, I'm sure, know. Every four years, they give out or, or issue a report card on America's infrastructure and, in fact, do uh, letter grades, breaking it down by various um, segments of the infrastructure system, and did so uh, probably about six weeks ago uh, for their 2021 report card. Uh, and you can see the grades on a couple of key areas that we want to focus on today. And quite simply, of course, not good. That C minus grade actually is a tick up from where it was in the 2017 report card. Uh, amazing as that sounds, but you can clearly see on a couple of key um, uh, areas for folks on this call, for our steel industry, for a number of other reasons is far from um, being satisfactory at a number of levels. And then they did another report at the beginning of this year, beginning of this calendar year, which um, quantified um, the economic impacts basically of failing to act. When we don't see federal infrastructure legislation at a scale that it needs to be, what are the opportunity costs? What are the economic impacts of not doing what we need to do, of, of sticking with the status quo. And they quantified some of that there. And it's quite substantial. As you can see, the numbers are significant. And even in the opportunity cost alone for the overall impact on GDP, at over $10 trillion of GDP contributions and then 3 million fewer jobs, which is um, quite striking given where, given where we are at a macroeconomic level across the country currently. So with that, uh, what Congress and policymakers at the White House typically do uh, is look for ways to address those uh, deficiencies through uh, and seeing clear opportunities to move forward in this area. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out here. Number one, that infrastructure investment is really a rare bipartisan issue here in D.C. and across the country. Not surprisingly, and certainly we've seen this over the past year or more, uh, partisan um, disagreement on a number of issues across the spectrum are probably at an all-time high. Contrast that with infrastructure investment, which is certainly something from my perspective and most perspectives is a rare bipartisan issue. And that comes across in all the public polling you see, infrastructure spending gets extremely high support uh, in public polling. Members of Congress from you know the far left to the far right all make statements about the importance of federal infrastructure, about federal investment in infrastructure and the need to move forward in that direction. And then you see a lot of outside uh, stakeholders, both business groups, Chamber of Commerce, uh, National Association of Manufacturers, AISI, all through them to other labor groups, USW, um, the host of building trades, environmental groups um, as well, all generally, and I would say even more specifically supportive of infrastructure investment. So what does that mean? It also points out that there are key deadlines approaching and Congress often um, works or acts or doesn't work um, when spurred by deadlines. And so we are seeing now over the next year, uh, perhaps even less, some key deadlines approaching. Number one, the key surface transportation authorizations will expire at the end of September this year. That's for the Highway Trust Fund, a number of other key programs uh, for federal infrastructure investments. And then the Highway Trust Fund, as I mentioned before, um, is slated to be insolvent at some point in fiscal year 2022. Graphic indication of that 
on this slide here. And you can see in the middle when outlays and revenues are going to uh, are going to flip. Um, so this is the highway trust fund is quite simply the amount of money that comes in for every gallon of gasoline that anyone purchases 18.4 cents of that goes to the highway trust fund. And that from its beginning was slated to keep that trust fund going in perpetuity. Now we see cars driving a lot less, number one. Number two, cars getting a lot more mileage per gallon, obviously, than electric vehicles, et cetera. Um, we're seeing less and less revenues into the trust fund at the same time the outlays continue to increase. So what we are seeing here is that inflection point coming up in FY22. Uh, last year, fiscal 20, we would have had a similar point, but instead there was a transfer in um, uh, October, no, I'm sorry, September of last year, 2020, that transferred funds from the federal general fund over to the highway trust fund to push down the line, this inflection point. That may happen again coming up next year, but it remains to be seen exactly what's going to happen there. So, because of that, we've seen a number of all these factors. We've seen a number of key policy plans put forward in recent weeks. Number one being the president, President Biden's American Jobs Plan, which he rolled out in Pittsburgh uh, not too long ago, uh, calling for spending two and a quarter uh, trillion dollars over an eight year standpoint. And you can see graphically how that breaks down uh, from your traditional transportation utilizations on the 621 billion. I'll talk about that more uh, in a minute <clears throat> to um, uh, manufacturing, to schools and water, all of those items all the way down through to workforce development, quite a substantial size plan. Delving a little bit deeper into the service transportation funding, you can see here not only does this would this go to be spent on bridges, highways, and roads, things like that, which are your traditional uses of transportation infrastructure at a federal level, public transit, obviously Amtrak, this concept of infrastructure resilience um, in the um, the current um, state of of severe weather, other impacts from climate change. Uh, and I also want to point out the issue or the, the purposes, stated purposes of electric vehicles, which is obviously a top priority for the president, for the administration, for a number of stakeholders. Um, and something that if this plan were to move forward, would have a substantial amount of money to build out um, not only electric vehicles themselves, but charging stations and a network of infrastructure around how to fuel vehicles through the electric grid. Um, and then moving on, and I shouldn't uh, skip over waterways and ports, which is important for our industry and, and a lot of other stakeholders as well. But you can see there, this is a pretty vast and substantial plan. How does that get paid for? So what the president has proposed here um, is to over 15 years, not the eight years that the increased spending would go for, but over 15 to raise about $2 trillion in taxes. And the primary ways in which to do that would be to change the corporate income tax level and uh, increasingly tax offshore earnings. So going back on and changing some of the changes to the tax code that was made in the Trump administration in 2017 um, to raise revenue that way. And this has gotten a substantial amount of pushback, of course, from the business community and other stakeholders as well. But it's important to recognize that's what the that's what the administration, that's what the president is talking about and the plan that they've put forward. On the flip side of that coin, Senate Republicans released a framework a couple of weeks ago that was a much more substan uh, much more tailored and focused um, plan for, for your traditional uses of infrastructure. So again, roads and bridges and broadband and public transit, all of those usage uh, utilization programs that were included partially in the Biden plan, but again, none of the non-traditional aspects of that plan. And most importantly, here at the bottom, the Republicans not calling for any changes to the tax code to pay for um, to pay for those infrastructure purposes using existing funding mechanisms to get there. So. 
Um, backing up a few slides, I tried to lay out how there's a lot of overlap and a lot of um, a lot of common ground on these issues. As I just showed, though, on the last couple of slides, there's a pretty broad gap between the key parties, and uh, there's a few ways in which that gap is uh, sort of exacerbated. One is what the definition of infrastructure is, quote unquote. You ask anybody probably on this call what that means at a federal level in, in particular, you're going to get different answers. I think traditionally you would get that first sub bullet, roads, bridges, transit, airports, water projects as pretty mainly focusing on what infrastructure really is. Perhaps you expand that a bit more in your definition to schools and broadband and build out of the electric grid, shoring up the electric grid from a, from a security standpoint uh, would probably be in there as well. What we're, we're seeing more now is, is the administration is pushing the infrastructure definition to be expanded into areas like housing and elder care, workforce development, and other uses in manufacturing too, I should include that, is that's not traditionally been defined as infrastructure at a federal level. So that is a, a uh, very much a disagreement between the two parties on that. I mentioned before the financing, how you pay for all of this. Um, <clears throat> substantial opposition, as I mentioned, any Republican from any Republicans, for the most part, on changing the 2017 tax law, uh, tax reform from 2017. And then I would say another bipartisan issue is the hesitancy to adjust the gas tax and other user fees, those user fees which fund the highway trust fund, which I pointed out before in the, the bar chart, um, there have been a few proposals to adjust raise that gas tax, but for the most part that has been rejected um, pretty strongly by members of, of, of both parties at a national level. There's been some, and then of course we've seen a number of states move forward and increase their own individual state gas taxes but by and large, that's not a concept that's gotten off the ground here in DC uh, to really be a substantial policy mechanism. And then as always, politics rears its head in a lot of these things. Quite simply, every day that goes by, we get closer to the midterm elections of 2022. Uh, Republicans think that they could take back or take the majority in either the House or the Senate or both next year, which is traditionally what happens in the first midterm election cycle after a new president is sworn into office. And so some Republican um, hesitancy there, to be quite frank, is if they move forward with infrastructure legislation, does that give a quote unquote win to the president, to national Democrats as we approach those, uh, as we approach those elections? So those are all things certainly at play. Just to give you a little bit of some inside baseball, um, and uh, I try not to be too specific on a lot of these things, but there are options involved for moving a process forward if there becomes a will to move on infrastructure legislation. Number one is your standard um, moving bills in both the House and Senate. Committee, committees in both the House and Senate have indicated that they wanna move surface transportation, even if those bills are gonna be on a partisan level by Memorial Day, and I do think that'll happen. Moving forward on a non number of other steps there, the old uh, schoolhouse rock on how bills become law. Those things could all happen later this summer for bills to get to the floor uh, and potential key items like the funding uh, would be necessary from the non-transportation committees as well. Uh, and then potentially to have conferences in August and September to work out the differences between um, the two versions of the bill, one house, one Senate. There are, of course, a number of major issues that would need to be addressed uh, as I lay out here. But uh, above all of that is the Senate filibuster issue, which requires, as many folks know, 60 votes to pass substantial legislation. So if something were to pass in that typical, uh, again, uh, process, it would take a good deal of compromise to get that 60 vote level in the Senate as, as uh, Democrats only have uh, 50 plus one majority um, with the vice president breaking ties in the Senate. Another option is what's called bu budget reconciliation. And without getting too in the weeds on this, because not too many people are interested in that, um, is something that can be passed with a simple majority in both the House and the Senate. 
And that's been done a number of times in the past. Most recently, the American Rescue Plan from February this year with, uh, I believe it was $1.9 trillion in COVID relief funding, uh, stimulus checks, which most folks are aware of, and a number of other aspects there. That was done by reconciliation, and it was able to be done because one party is in the majority in both the House and Senate and in the White House. On the other side of the coin, that's also what happened in 2017 in the Trump administration when the Republicans reduced business and individual taxes <clears throat> through the 2017 tax, and, tax Cut and Jobs Act. So it's possible that Democrats could decide to go down that path this year to provide additional direct funding for surface transportation, whether it be water or highways, as I listed out there. What can't be done for the most part under infrastructure is dealing with a lot of policy issues. So things that typically are done in uh, service transportation authorizations, the Buy America one is one that AISI is particularly involved with and others aren't able to be done if you go down the path of reconciliation. So um, we, of course, as I mentioned, I'm not forecasting here, but I can tell you that uh, certainly House and Senate transportation committees are going to move forward in May with the initial steps on surface transportation and other um, infrastructure legislation, which is obviously a positive step moving forward. There's a number of other hurdles at play here, both processes and policies that need to get dealt with before a final bill can be signed into law. So um, those are the slides that I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, there's my last slide with my contact information.